gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. Today it is our honor to welcome one of Europe's most successful investigative journalists. He works for the Zoo Deutsche Zeitung and was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the highest honor in journalism for the publication of the famous Panama Papers. The Panama Papers was a massive leak that exposed corruption and offshore tax evasion on a huge scale. Bastian Obermeier leads a whole team of investigative journalists and he's part of a global network of international crime reporters. And uh, you may know him from the Panama Papers. There's other publications he's famous for, like the Paradise Papers, the Pandora Papers, which are both cases of massive tax evasion and money laundering. The Ibiza scandal, I think there's some uh, Austrians in the audience, uh, led to the fall of the Austrian government. But their most recent story is the Swiss secrets. So today we will discuss the behind the scenes of this story, as well as investigative journalism in general, the dangers journalists face, and the shock waves their story sends through the world. So there will be time, of course, for audience question. Now please give a warm welcome to Bastian Obermeier. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Bastian. Uh, thanks for flying in. You flew in uh, exactly for this uh, event, and you're flying out again tonight. How are you today? I'm fine. It's a wonderful city, and, and there's sun and nice people, I hope. So it's great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in the first half of this uh, session, we'd like to talk about the Swiss secrets. And... Uh, Maybe for those in the audience who've never heard about it, could you tell us a little bit, why, why is this story so interesting? So it's about Swiss bank accounts. And if I say Swiss bank accounts, that's always very interesting for any journalist because um, Switzerland is still selling secrecy. So if you get money that you don't want anyone to know about, you put it in a Swiss bank account and no one is going to know. Um, it used to be like this for like many years when they have even had even the numbered bank account. Now they had to adapt a little more to more, more transparency, but they still live this life of secrecy. And most of the accounts that we saw, we, we, we got leaked more than 30,000 bank accounts. And most of those were, were still from a time when it was absolute secrecy. So it was really interesting to look into those data and see who's hiding there like kings and presidents and uh, dictators. So it was a, a big party for us. Okay, so we need a little bit more of context here. Um, so we know that in popular culture, there is nowhere safer to stash your cash than the vault of a Swiss bank. And so we were wondering, is this actually the first time you managed to open the vaults and get secret information? Well, it depends on how you define a Swiss bank because we already had the Swiss leaks affair when the ICHA, the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists, where I'm a part of, got leaked a part of um, the banking data of HSBC Swiss. Mm -hmm. But the HSBC is a British bank, so it's not a, the Swiss bank. And the funny thing was, when we published those data and that story, whole Switzerland was, was saying, yeah, well, but it's not a Swiss bank. Mm -hmm. So they said it's, you know, it's a UK bank and it's maybe their bank in Geneva where you get the data, got the data from, but it's not a real Swiss bank. And now that we published the Swiss secrets about uh, the credit Swiss data, which is one of the two biggest Swiss banks, they said, yeah, well, it's not the first leak. I mean, they, we've had this, <laughs> we had the Swiss leaks before, so why are you now pretending this is a big thing? I mean, uh, HSBC was also a Swiss bank. And we were like, okay. I mean, <laughs> in the end, it doesn't matter how you label it. It's all about the stories, and that's what we tried to sell them. Yeah. And so why is it so complicated for journalists to investigate banks in Switzerland? So because um, in Switzerland, there's the Article 47, um, which is a, a law about banking secrecy that does not allow anyone to report anything that's going on with Swiss bank accounts. So, so if someone would come to me and hand me over data showing that you are having a Swiss bank account and 
you're not having a Swiss bank account, it would be forbidden by the law for me, first of all, to look at the data and then to give it to a third party and of course to publish it. And I would not even be allowed to say that you're not having a Swiss bank account because this is also breaching the Swiss banking law because you're not allowed to say anything about who's having a Swiss bank account and who's not having a Swiss bank account. And this is a very, I mean, I think we all can agree that this is kind of extreme. If you're not, not, even, not even allowed to say that someone's not having a bank account in Switzerland. And, but the reason is they just don't want anyone to talk about that. And so the, the, the big difference is now when I'm reporting about banking accounts in Germany, I'm not allowed to write about your bank account in Germany. You, you, you're from Germany, you probably have a bank account there. I'm not allowed to write about that because there's no public interest in your bank account. At least I hope that, because it would mean that you haven't robbed the bank or something Oops, like that. I so, I <laughs> so, so, but if there's public interest because your father is the king of Jordan and you've stashed like 300 million US dollars on your German bank account, I would as a journalist, of course, be allowed to write about that because there's probably some slush funds that's probably from high corruption and it's probably not your money because you know, with your age, you probably haven't earned 300 million. But in Switzerland, there's no way, there's just no reason that it's given to journalists to report on Swiss bank account. It's just not allowed, whatever. And I think that's not really- uh, Is this then why you had no Swiss reporter that could actually participate in the investigation? Yes, exactly. So we had offered um, to our partner from Tamedia, which whom we have worked for years now on the Panama Papers and all their stories. And they said, we can't touch this because we have to go to jail there. Yeah. And would you say that you yourself personally now would fear going to Switzerland today? Well, I don't really say I would fear. But you I think I just, I just wouldn't go there. <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's probably, they're not stupid. They wouldn't arrest me, but probably I would need to visit a police station or something. Mm -hmm. It's not a good idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about where this, this all first started. Can you tell us a little bit about when did the source first make contact and, and how? So of course I cannot say when the source first contacted me and how, but I can say that it's more than a year ago. Um, and we have a platform that's called Secure Drop. It means you are secure when you drop us something and it's being set, set up by the Freedom of the Press Foundation where the president is Edward Snowden, that some of you might know. And he knows a thing or two about secrecy. Um, <laughs> So we can assume that when you go there and you drop us a secret, it's kind of secret, really. And someone dropped us this, those bank accounts, and so we could go through them. And that's, that happened in more than a year ago. That's, that's all we can say. I'm sorry. I would love to give you more details, but we don't want to endanger our sources. And you... Maybe you can tell us this. You don't know the source yourself. No, right? we it's have also anonymous. So that's the beauty of it that um, we don't have any clue who's behind that. We just know that someone um, with a very strange name. Um, um, it's just um, um, it's called Soporific Debta. That was the name of that person that was by chance generated in the system, and he contacted us, and we don't know the real identity. Okay, and the. Uh, what would happen, hypothetically, if your source got exposed? What could be the consequences for them? Three to five years in jail. <coughs> Three to five years in jail. Three to five years in jail in, in Switzerland. Okay. I mean, it's not, they don't have the worst jails, probably. Um, if you <laughs> A nice hotel in the, in the Alps. Somewhere. But, I mean, it's just, it's not freedom, so you don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, so you have the data, and what's next? What, what did you do? So, then? so what what you do is you have to understand what you are having in front of you, and in this case, we are having many 
lines of, of banking data. And you have to understand, is it really useful? And is it really something that, that is of public interest? So you, you, you need to understand, do you have a king here? Or do you have just ordinary people? And if it's only ordinary people, it's not a story. I mean, there's just nothing you can do about it then. Um, you need to have high public interest. That's the source for everything. That's, that's, that's always the thing that we need. No matter if you're reporting about Austria and the Ibiza affair, the, those, the, the video, the Ibiza video, was of high public interest because we had the vice chancellor of Austria sitting there on a couch like this mm -hmm. and speaking about how he wants this Russian oligarch, who is very close to Vladimir Putin, help him buy the election. Mm -hmm. So this isn't what you should be doing as a politician, of course. So, um, and while the video was taped secretly, and that's not allowed, it's not allowed to tape someone secretly and then sell the video. But it's, if you have someone telling, if you bribe me, you get a lot of money back, then it's allowed because then you have high public interest. And that's the same with those bank accounts. So we had to see, are there public figures who can give away, for example, state contracts? And if those public figures, I think we had a case in Uzbekistan or something, and if those figures get high million dollar sums, and they don't have another explanation, then we really don't want to talk about this. Then you have high public interest. If you have, we, we already had people in the Panama Papers who had Swiss bank accounts that we saw in the Panama Papers. And it was someone from the richest families in Germany. And, and we asked them, you know, look, we've seen this bank account in Switzerland and we need an explanation. And they said, so look, my daughter was studying there. She was living in Switzerland. So it kind of made sense for her to have a Swiss bank account. And the money wasn't a lot. I mean, she's just very, very rich. So it was more than I'll ever have in my life. But um, if you're studying in Switzerland, Switzerland is expensive. You need a lot of money. Um, so that didn't get over the bar of high public interest. So we never did that story. Mm -hmm. It was a great name. It would have been a great story. Everyone would have listened when we would have announced this person is having a Swiss bank account. But there was just no, no justification to publish it. Right. And so when we looked through the Swiss secrets, we were looking for justification. Mm -hmm. Or like open-minded, we tried to understand, is this really a story? Or is it just Swiss banking data? Mm -hmm. And so we started throwing in names of, of people that we know are really fishy and we have many lists of people of, who are having political power in the world, who are leading big companies, who are well-known football stars and all that. And, and then we're trying to see what, what we find. And the other way around, um, um, we, we, we teamed up with the OCCRP which is a huge network of international reporters who have specialized a lot on crime and corruption. And we all scammed through the, the data for like many months. Mm -hmm. and, and we took in people from all kinds of countries because I don't know who is important in Bulgaria or in Albania or even, even in Austria. I don't really know most of the players. Mm -hmm. And so we would have missed a lot of stories. And... and um, so when the, the people said that we have a former prime minister from Algeria and we have th this and this and this, then we saw at a certain point, now we've got our story. We have so many important people that we can report on the league as a whole, mm -hmm. which, which of course um, the bank didn't like. So when we, uh, when we contacted them and explained them, we have bank accounts, we think it's of, of big public interest and we would like to publish and... Here's a list of 178 questions. <laughs> then they and their lawyers explained to us that they are going to sue us to hell and they, we were not going to allow to publish and, and, and we got no place to hide. And also they referred to the, the Article 47, which just plainly says it's forbidden by law. And uh, there was back and forth. But 
the the most important thing is always if if you have data that may be obtained illegally then the threshold for your story is higher than when you, you know someone just put this this data sheet here and i think there's a story on i don't need a big big justification because you know i just found it and mm -hmm. <laughs> i can do a story and about the data um it could have been fraudulent right it could have been completely yeah. made up how did you check that it's really reliable data so um what we did we tried to we tried to cross reference the data like um we made um we extracted a list like in an excel file and we do have in our uh, no, in our servers data like the 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 company registers of certain countries the panama papers the paradise papers and all kinds of other data that we just you know we just like to have data so we we gathered a lot of data along the way and we compared it we saw we we tried to find out do we see do we see an account here for example that had already been mentioned in a court case so we know it's legit so we found bank accounts um in the Swiss secrets that were already mentioned in court cases so we knew okay it's an really existing account mm -hmm. then we 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 looked through the panama papers we found uh, we found banking data in the Swiss secrets that were already mentioned in the panama papers or people who had like uh, a piece of paper in the panama papers that said from from the credit swiss where they said yeah he is our client we trust him he can have an offshore company no problem he's got enough money mm -hmm. so we could see okay that guy really was a customer really was a client of of credit mm -hmm. swiss mm -hmm. and at a certain point i even started calling people and so so when i found out that someone had a bank account and was from germany and i looked at the guy and i understood he's not really important he's just someone who closed the bank account also 10 or 15 years ago so it's not news anymore and he doesn't have anything to fear because after 10 years he can't go so even if it was illegal he can't go to jail anymore in germany um so i called people and said um don't be shocked um <laughs> i want to speak about your swiss bank account and i explained that we get leaks you know all the time and that w w then w when we want to find out if if those bad guys you know so we want to write about bad guys but first we have to make sure the data is real so when we do these cross checks and this phone call that i'm doing right now with you is part of those cross checks and we don't want to write about you we just want to make sure that the data is legit so would you be up for me to explain that you did have this bank account and tell me how much was on it and when mm -hmm. you did start to have it and when you stopped it and i mean one guy just said fuck off um <laughs> <laughs> and the other one said no problem it's completely legal and we just compared the data and a third guy said well actually um i'm not sure but you don't you re you really promise you're not telling anyone because it was kind of not completely legal so <laughs> <laughs> um but in the end we had enough um proof that we could say in general the data seems okay it seems mm -hmm. fine that doesn't mean you can just write a story from the data but it means that you can trust the data as far as you can go to contact the people you really want to write about mm -hmm. um so because it still means if you contact someone and say look um you are a minor um guy at some some government position in in algeria and you've got like five millions on your bank account and you want to speak about that the problem still is if they say i have no clue what you're talking about mm -hmm. and you have no other proof outside the data you most likely can't do the story yeah. because you need a second proof and if if the other side is giving you nothing else then i really don't know what you're talking about 
then it's hard to do the story. And then it's again, the more important the guy is, the, the better the chances that, that you can do the story. So if like we have Angela Merkel in the data and she said, I don't know what you're talking about, but we think, okay, it's, I mean, she was chancellor. Mm -hmm. So we can do the story and say, it might or might not be her bank account, but it's in this data and that's already worth publishing. Um, but if someone is not famous and it's not important and you're not sure at all, mm -hmm. then you can't do it. Yeah. So once you have the data and you made sure it's reliable, um, you were able to publish and you actually published a month ago, but for a whole year, you work with thousands of journalists internationally in secret. And so how is such a level of cooperation possible? How does it concretely work? Well, it's, um, so the most important thing is everyone really has to shut up yeah. um, and not tell your friends. So, so in this time we work with 170 colleagues who actually wrote pieces. So if you say, you know, if every one of them is only telling three friends, you already are, have more than 500 people knowing about it and it's not going to hold. So you really have to be careful um, and you have to explain that to everyone and you need to put some pressure on the group and, 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 and the pressure that you can put on the group is, look, we've done a lot of really good investigations uh, like this with Secrets, Panama Papers and others and if you're the one to spoil it, you're not going to get invited anytime again. So that's something people can relate to. They get thrown out if they make a mistake. They don't want to make a mistake. Um, then you need to have a kind of a, a forum, like Facebook for Journalism, where you can put your findings in a secure way and you can speak about that. You can write yourself, not yourself, you can write messages to other uh, persons working on the same leak. And you can, you can upload documents and compare documents. You can, you can upload your notes. You can um, um, even work together on the draft. So you need to have this kind of um, secure collaboration platform. You probably also wanna meet in person at least once to build the trust that you know the face of the others and that you can ah, say, I don't like that you know, what he has in his eyes, so <laughs> I don't tell him what I've got. No, but, but you, you need to have a basic class. And we are lucky that we did with those guys, you know, quite some stories in the last year, so that trust has already built up. And then you can just um, share the work. And you, you say, okay, we're gonna look through the German names and we're gonna look through those names. And, and in formal times, if you had a reporter in Germany, you focused on the German story. And the German story was a guy living in Munich, having a bank account in Frankfurt, and was doing a business in Berlin, maybe. But, but, but now the, the world is so globalized that, 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 I mean, I don't even remember which story was the last story that was only German. Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest story that we did in Germany from this league was a guy who used to work for Siemens. Uh, he used to be the head of Siemens Nigeria. And he had on his bank account 54 million US dollars in 2006, which was like only a couple of months before the big Siemens corruption scandal broke. And he, he earned a lot of money, but not quite 54 million. Mm -hmm. So there was no explanation why he got that. But we needed the people in Nigeria on the ground to help us do the reporting. And that's what, what those collaborations are about, that, that, that you, you, you're not alone in and that. you had those people as well? Sorry? You had those people in Nigeria? Yeah, we, we had people mm -hmm. in Nigeria um, who tried to find out you know, if he had other businesses there. Mm -hmm. And they actually found two companies that he founded in the 90s with people working at the state um, um, phone agency, like in the government, the, the people who were giving out state contracts uh, to big telecom communications like Siemens, 
So he had a he had a common business with them, and it's completely unclear what for. The only thing that we know is it doesn't make any sense if you are doing legal stuff. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but, but but we don't know what what it was about. Right, and um, you. I remember when I was reading the, through the Swiss secrets, uh, there was also a story with a uh, the president, I think, of Armenia. Can you yeah. elaborate on that one? Yeah, so it's uh, Mr. Sarkisian, and he had uh, bank accounts. He, he didn't have huge money or only a couple of millions, but um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not you, it's just a lot. But he used to be a business guy, so, so it's known that he's got a lot of money. The interesting thing in his case was that when, when our Algeria, uh, our partners from Algeria approached him, he said he didn't have to tell the, the corruption agency of Algeria that he got that bank account because he wasn't in office back then. And then we looked it up and he, he was in office, not as president, but as, as ambassador. Um, I think it was ambassador. And so, so I wrote him another message. It was a Sunday noon and I was late with that message, uh, that email and I wrote it. And half an hour later, a colleague called me and said, he stepped back, did you see that? And I said, what? No way. And, and we looked it up and he just stepped back as president of Algeria. And, and like half an hour before he sent me that message where he said, nothing to see mm -hmm. here. You know, it's just a bank account. I don't know what you even want from me. I'm a, I used to be a businessman. And so we still don't know what happened there. There was another story into his business things that was not yet published, which might have... A, a bigger influence on his uh, uh, on him stepping back, um, but now the 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 national corruption agency is looking at that case, and we might get an answer in a couple of weeks okay. or more. So uh, let's hope we hear about that again. Yeah, um, I'm hoping too. An important question for your work is: Were who are the victims in these corruption scandals? Well, in a way, it's. It's all of us. I mean, it's everyone who's who's paying his taxes or her taxes and is financing hospitals, schools, good roads, whatever. Because it's 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 this is being paid from our money, and if the people who have the most money pay the least taxes and just go away and stash it in Switzerland and are not contributing their fair share to our society, then we have a big problem. And it's especially a big problem if you the, the poorer the countries <laughs> are and the more corrupt, and this is sadly true for many countries, the poorer the population, the more corrupt the leaders are. And, and, and if you're looking at Africa, there's a whole continent being blundered now for, for, for decades by really corrupt politicians, by really corrupt companies like 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 Siemens and and by by people who just go there and take you know the gold and and the diamonds and whatever they get there they bribe the leaders you know that they, they they know if they give five million to a corrupt leader they get diamonds worth 500 million so they can also give him 10 million or 50 million or 50, they just don't care because they know that they can make so much profit. And um, it's, this is really, uh, uh, really heartbreaking because if, if you look at those, those, for example, diamond or gold mines, you look around and people are literally starving in the villages around that and not having schools or, or you know, you know, clean water and whatever. But, but there's just the money is just leaving the country without any trace there. And, and that's mm -hmm. a big problem there. But it's also a big problem here. So I think it's um, that, that you're right. It's hard to identify the victims because it's not. You don't see one people who got hit on his head. One one person. You just see that the money is disappearing. Yeah. And so we noticed that you publish the leak um, around the same time as Putin started invading Ukraine. Yeah. 
was and great. so overnight, media around the world just turn around to <laughs> Eastern Europe and not so much to Switzerland. So what do you do when your story gets overshadowed by a bigger story? Well, what do you do? You, you curse. <laughs> and, and, and so it's, I mean, in this case, in all honesty, what happened in Ukraine is just so much more important that, that we, we didn't even start to complain because, because you don't, I don't, it's just not right. But theoretically, of course, you, you need to think what, what do you do to get the most attention for your story? Because you, of course, think that your story is important and needs attention. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, when we took the last, the last decision on the day before we published, um, and we made a big call with 50 colleagues, and we all agreed that probably Putin is going to invade Ukraine, but no one knows when he's going to mm -hmm. do that. So he can do it the next day or three days after, which was what happened, or three weeks after. Or three months after, you just—I mean, nobody can look in the head of yeah, uh, this insane person. Not possible to get. So, but would you say that in general, your story had less impact than expected? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, probably not in Switzerland because in Switzerland we had like two days, and there was enough to get everything going. So they are having a a, a debate in Parliament, I think, this week, and they uh, are. It, it looks like they may abolish this this law that brings journalists in jail if they're using banking data. So um, uh, our colleagues there spoke to the the people from I think three parties there in the parliament who all agree that this can't be even in Switzerland. This is what they say. Even even in Switzerland, we should not put journalists in jail. Which <laughs> 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 is a great way to look at that. Um, so, so we're probably going to have, you know, some impact there. But of course, if you're having a leak like this, your your hoping is your hope is that people speak about that at least for three or four or five mm -hmm. days. I mean, honestly, it's we are used to that. Um, 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 the media is very fast turning their attention to something mm -hmm. else, and so are the people. So. So I remember when we did the Panama Papers, like I think five or six days after Jan Böhmermann, a German uh, 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 comedian, got sued by Erdogan in Turkey mm -hmm. because he had insulted him in really uh, insane ways. Um, <laughs> and, and all the media was like, Panama, ah, Böhmermann got <laughs> sued. What a story. And, and, and I mean, that's just how the world is. I mean, you, you, you got to accept that or you get mm -hmm. crazy. But, but of course, so, so when we, we always try to look at the timing and when we published the Panama Papers, for example, our biggest fear was not Jan Böhmermann, but um, that Helmut Kohl, the former, the former chancellor of Germany, um, like three days before we published, one of our colleagues who knew a friend of him, he came in and he was really gray and he said, looks like he's going to die on the weekend. And we all said, no way, no way, he can't <laughs> die this weekend. <laughs> Give him all the medical help. I mean, he, he can't be so annoying to us for 16 years and then just die on the weekend. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> um, he, he lived on. Everything was fine. Uh, uh, and and you now the biggest fear is always you have a big project and then the Pope dies on the same day. And your project is like mm. just <laughs> did we have anything? It's like it's it's gone, mm. and and that's um, that's how it is. It's you just you know bad luck mm. and you move on. Right, um, and I think at least now a full room of people has heard your story, um, who may not have heard it before. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> and so I think this is a good moment maybe to open the floor to any questions that you in the audience might have. So please raise your hand if, uh, if you'd like to ask a question. The lady here in the front, maybe? Wait, wait, we have a, a mic <laughs> coming to the area here. <coughs> coming around. Here in the front. 
uh, you just talked about um, the motivation. I want to know uh, what uh, does keep you motivated in those cases and, and also in, the, in your whole work. It is in a certain way very dangerous, I, I think, that you can move. And, but what is your inner movement or motivation to do this? I think one part is that I really don't like injustice and that I don't like, you know, if I see something that's not wrong, I, I want to correct it. In many cases, cases that's not happening, <laughs> but still, I mean, you try. And, and then, I mean, it's maybe sounds strange, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, the, you know, it's, it, it's really fun to do this kind of job because it's, it's never boring. It's always something new. It's always exciting. It's always something that that keeps you on your toes. It's um, you always try to see what's what's your next story. And uh, we've got fantastic colleagues around the world. It's it's like family. Meanwhile, the the international colleagues is always like when we we we'll, we're gonna meet in three weeks at a conference in Perugia in Italy, and it's gonna be like a family meeting. So it's it's really fun. It's really a, a fun job. Um, you should not you should not have um, the will that you you really want want to change the world. I mean, it's good if you have the the impetus, but just don't be sad if it doesn't happen. It's uh, because in many cases it, it does not. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anybody else with a question? Um, maybe the. Y young man in the back. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, I was just wondering. Uh, for example, the Prime Minister in Czech Republic, uh, the ex-Prime Minister, he was exposed in the Pandora Papers for a lot of shady deals there as well. And you mentioned that in your data, you're always looking for stories uh, to publish and really get the media going on. But I was thinking about the connection of your data towards uh, actual uh, legal problems and maybe the police and some accountability to the future because our ex-prime minister is going to become president soon and despite all this data existing and I'm just really questioning what uh, mechanisms there are or more they're not to kind of keep these people accountable. Well, I don't know if I really understood your question but I'm trying to, to get an answer. So. We are not the government, and and we don't share our data with governments because we we want to we want to go separated because we want to control governments and not work hand in hand with them. The moment you work in hand in hand with the government, it's hard to criticize those people that you're having on your hands. It's that there's no, so you need to have space between. Um, but you know, aside from that, the only thing we can do as media is publish our stories and hope that the people react to that, like in the case of Babish, what you're probably referring to. And and that's you know where, where the things that we do just end. And if people are going on and elect those pe those guys, those politicians. Mm -hmm. It's just their decision, and nothing we can do. I mean, we can't, we can't invade other countries to make them stop doing this, and we should not do that, um, honestly. So the only thing is, we can speak truth to power, and then let the people decide. And we all know we've we've got countries um, like like Austria. When we published the Ibiza videos, the people were taking the streets and demonstrating, and not even a day later the government broke. And when we were, were doing similar stories about Russia, about the best friend of Vladimir Putin having bank accounts like worth billions of US dollars, they just don't, didn't care. You know, the, the, we published in Russia, Novaya Gazeta published, published the story there, and, and Putin said in live TV that his friend who's a musician, so there's no explanation how he could have billions, you know? And Putin said, my friend is caring for the Russian soul and he's buying good instruments for young Russian people, 
And I mean, that's ridiculous. But, but no one said, that's ridiculous. So just, they just nodded and, and, and moved on. And so since then, we are, we are looking, because someone in Russia needs to be, be a huge barn where all those instruments worth billions of US dollars are stashed for the young, talented musicians. Um, no, you, you just get used to there are countries where your reporting is you know, causing re real uproar and change, and there are countries where it just doesn't matter. That's how it is. Yeah, um, maybe we'll have some room for questions later on. Um, there's a study that we found uh, by the University of Oxford, and uh, according to them, the panel papers led to reforms in 20% of the countries that were involved. And that's great, <laughs> but it means... I didn't know that. <laughs> I'll share it with you later on. But it means, of course, that there were no reforms in 80% of the countries. And then... Uh, according to the study, even more than 90% of all the public officials that were on that list that you published are still in office today. That's kind of depressing. <laughs> well, well, to our defense, <laughs> um, um, no, you, when you're doing this kind of work, you, 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 can't, uh, um, you can't do it when you think you need to have it justified after through change that happens. Because that's not, for me, I, I'm really holding this away. That's not my responsibility. We are writing our stories and whatever happens, it's not my job. So I'm, I'm not an activist trying to change the world. Um, I'm just telling the activists what, what we found out so they can change the world. And, and still, of course, we are trying to, to, to track the changes. And you know, after the Panama Papers, more than 1.3 billion US dollars flew, flew back to governments on, on taxes that haven't been paid before and that were regained. And you know, some, the, the, the prime minister of Pakistan had go to jail and the prime minister of Iceland lost his office and all that. So things happen, but there's always, you know, Things happen until they don't happen. And, and the, the, I think the biggest change after the Panama Papers, which is like a watershed in the offshore industry world, is like before there were many, many companies, so-called offshore providers, where you could go and could buy for, for 50 bucks, just an offshore company in Nevis or British Virgin Islands or whatever. And they would not even ask you, you know, where the money is from, who you are, do you know any, any, any uh, um, politically exposed person, who is your father. Um, so they just took it and gave you the offshore company and you could do whatever you want, all kinds of financial crime. This has changed. So now they, at least they have to follow the letter of the law. Like everyone now has to have on file, um, um, some kind of proof who you are, some kind of um, um, your electri electri electricity bill that shows that you're a real person paying your electricity or your water bill or whatever, and, and other things that show that you are the beneficial owner of the, that company and not someone else in the background. So this has happened. Does it now mean that it's not possible anymore? No but at least it's harder. And in the case of Germany, we know that um, the really cheap tax evasion schemes that was used by Swiss banks, which meant you come with 2 million, you get a Panamanian company, the Panamanian company is holding your bank account, so it's not in your name, you don't pay taxes. In Panama, there are no taxes, you get your money, you're fine. That's not happening anymore. Because even the banks, even the dirtiest banks, think this is too risky mm -hmm. for their reputation, mm -hmm. not for the moral. It's all about the reputation. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be the next bank of the next Swiss secrets. So they just want to have you know, clients where they at least can argue that it might have been legal. And that's their standard now. Mm -hmm. That's better than it was before when they just took plainly illegal stuff because they said, 
no one's going to know. Mm -hmm. right? right? So that seems like maybe there's been unquantifiable change that you couldn't list in percentage points. Yeah, at least I like to think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> um, on a different note, it was mentioned that your work can be quite dangerous. And um, yeah, I guess the question is, have you ever thought about not publishing a story because you feared about your own safety and that of your close? No, no, no. You only think that after you already published it. Mm. And you think like, fuck, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> but while you're still in, in your room working away, you, you don't really connect to what might happen. And so the, the only time we really thought about that for, for a minute was when we did the, the Panama Papers because there were so many Russian oligarchs in and and um, um, but but in the end, if you have your Russian partners <laughs> who are living there actually and who are taking another path to work every day, so that the, you know the government doesn't know which way to work they take in the next day, the, you feel like really small if you think I don't want to publish my name in Germany when no journalist has been killed for for, for his or her work in the last. 70, 80 years. And, but of course, so like everything, I don't, I don't want to destroy the mood in here, but, but of course, everything has changed when in Malta, our colleague Daphne Corona Galizia was killed by a car bomb. We knew her, her son was one of my closest friends in the international work, world of journalism. He used to work for that ICHJ. And and after her death, and then the killing of Jan Kuciak in Slovakia, who worked alongside with us on the Panama Papers, um, they both weren't killed directly for the Panama Papers, but in, in the case of Daphne, it's still possible that there was a connection. So... Um, but you have like a very strong and beautiful tagline about this, uh, killing the journalist won't kill the story. Yes, yes. So, so a friend of mine founded um, um, Forbidden Stories, which is an organization where, where I'm also um, having a part. And so we are continuing the work of colleagues who got killed or jailed. Mm. And um, because we want the bad guys to learn, you don't kill the message, you only kill the messenger. But the problem is that now with the rise of populism, what we see is that a lot of corrupt politicians, it's almost like they don't even bother to kill the journalists because... Which is good and bad, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> they can actually kill the story with fake news. Yeah. So how do you journalists deal with fake news, especially in the age of social media? Yeah, I mean, if we had an answer to that, that would be really smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would probably be out there already. Mm -hmm. So the only, the only way that I know is to, to, to do our job as, as credible and as transparent as we can. Um, and I think we, we can all do a lot, of, a lot better in, in terms of transparency. Um, um, when I started at our paper and, and when, when we asked our bosses, can we publish somewhat documents at least online, to show the people that we really got those documents and the proof and that people can look at that and can see, ah, oh, right, here's the name of the Prime Minister of Iceland. And so they can like double check our work in some way. Mm. Um, my boss has said, why would we do that? They have to believe us. We are the journalists. And I think that's completely and utterly wrong to think like that. And so I think we need to explain more why we do what we do and, and how we're doing it. We need to put more stuff online to make people understand that we're not only talking about that, but it's, it's actually proof that, that we haven't. And, and we have to explain to, to the people the difference between someone having a blog and posting just anything there and a media organization doing fact checks actually on stories and only publishing what they know is true and can, can stand in court. Um, but it's, 
I mean, it's it's really hard, and mm. and we're doing a lot of those things when our reporters going to schools and speaking to to young people and explain them. Uh, so what's a newspaper? <laughs> so really, as basic as that, uh, and, and what is the difference between my my Twitter account and the Twitter account? from Joey187. Um, who is saying that I'm lying? Mm -hmm. So who should they believe? There's two people on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really hard. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that you know, journalists alone can do that. I think that's the job of, of everyone. Yeah. And talking more about transparency and democracy, uh, the Washington Post recently said about Zelensky, uh, Ukrainian president, he is not just a man, but a symbol of democratic resistance. But last year, the Pandora Papers proved that Zelensky and his inner circle have a network of offshore companies. So does it worry you that a man who is literally a big, like, he is a, a symbol of democracy today, is also hiding millions in the British Virgin Islands? So actually, I don't think that he himself hid millions. So, um, but through his friends. Right? Yes. So, so w I think I don't. I didn't do that story, the, but 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 I think that one of his supporters had millions in offshore companies, and which is a kind of a problem. If 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 you he always argued this shouldn't be the case, and if you are kind of part of this. Mm. I mean, why should people still believe you? And that was kind of our story back then. Um, and yes, of course, I, I, I don't like that. But I think you, you still have to say, so maybe he did shady business. Maybe he even participated or maybe he knowingly took advantage of, of money that was not really really clean but I think you can still they say on the other hand what he's doing right now that he's trying to to really defend his country with all his will and you know everything he's got to stand up against Russia yeah. um but but yeah I think um just the list of corrupt politicians is long and yeah. they come from all around the world and some are authoritarian some are democratic leaders so it almost seems like it's just power corrupts. Yeah, that, that's a big question. If that, There's a really good book uh, on the question if power corrupts or if the corrupts are searching the power and trying to, to get more power for it because they are corrupt and, and, and where the circle is starting. Um, it's, it's called Corruptible by Brian Glass. It's, it's a really interesting book. And... The the back the the the, the main get of it, the main takeaway is we have to design our societies we have to we have to design our political system in a way that you get the least out of it once you corrupt and that the corrupt the, the corrupt people get punished <laughs> if they are being corrupt but that that's you know easy said but not it's not so easy done yeah. I'm sure our audience still has a lot of questions. So, if there's anyone, um, the um, long woman with long hair, blonde. Hey, uh, Bastian, thanks for being here. I think it's probably a very uh, stressful time right now as a journalist. You mentioned in the beginning that you don't go, or you wouldn't opt for going to Switzerland on holiday now. And I think that is maybe still an acceptable payoff for your investigation. But then colleagues, in the biggest sense of yours, like Julian Assange, had to live in an embassy for years. Um, Edward Snowden is in exile. Is, can you imagine a situation when you are leaked a story that you would opt, or maybe it has happened, that you opt to not go for it, to, well, maybe not be killed, but face other uh, circumstances that you wouldn't want your life to go to? Well, as it hasn't happened, um, it's hard to say. I can sit here and say, no, I would always go for the story. But, I mean, you know, if someone's showing up at your door and, and says, I'm going to kill your kids, 
I mean, probably I'm not not doing the story. I mean, I'm not I'm not a superhero, and 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 you know, kids are it's my kids. So it's I think it's 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 hard to say that, and I really um, admire especially Edward Snowden for his decision because he knew what's going to happen at least partly. Um, so I think um, you know in Germany, as long as I'm living in Germany and traveling to Netherlands and countries like that. I'm not really in danger. Um, there are some trade-offs. I'm not going to Russia anymore. Um, I'm not going to, to Panama, Switzerland. I mean, it's a bunch of countries meanwhile. Um, <laughs> um, Morocco also. Uh, but but um, that's fine for me. So And we even... Uh, um, on the side, we, we even flew to Russia after the Panama Papers for because we wanted to interview Edward Snowden, and and when he when he said yes, then we thought, oh fuck it, we can't go to Russia, we forgot, and and because we had the the German police had warned us not to do that, because they said you know you wrote about the best friends of the president and they don't forget that. Um, so we thought, but re we really want to do that interview. So we we um, we asked Mr. Snowden if we could do the interview on the first day of the football world championship in Russia, um, <laughs> because we thought that's probably a day when not even Putin wants to have the headline: Panama Papers journalists are arrested in Moscow, um, because he. You know, it's all about football. So uh, we flew with all the football fans on the plane. <laughs> we, we flew to Moscow. We met Mr. Snowden in the hotel. We didn't touch anything there. We didn't, uh, we didn't drink or we didn't eat there. And then there was a really funny uh, scene because we did the interview in the hotel room. And, and Snowden came in and we sat there. And like after one 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 hour, there was knocking on the door, and and we opened, and someone came in and brought two little chocolate things that they they put on the bed, um, um, and then they left. And he looked at it and he said, "Well, that's probably the plutonium now." <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I don't think that I actually laughed because. <laughs> Because we were really focused on, you know, we had our bottled waters and all that, and we flew back the next day. Did you eat the chocolate? No, no, <laughs> no. I, I think we didn't even touch it uh, um, because we didn't sleep in that in that bed. We had another room with, for the bed. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's part of a trade-off, and I think, so honestly, I think my life is most in danger when I'm going by bike to Munich, because people are driving crazy. There. So, you know, with big SUVs. And, and I think that's way more dangerous than doing my work. OK, I think we can have one last question. Um, the, well, let's have a man this time. <laughs> the back there. Hello. Hey. I know you said you're not a superhero, but I'm curious about your origin story. Uh, because in this room we've got a bunch of students who I feel like really care about what you're talking about, at least some part of them, but I mean, I do for sure. But a question that we're all facing is like, what are we going to do about that? And, you know, we have to manage also establishing ourselves while also trying to figure out how we're going to manifest what we care about. And so. I guess it's kind of a two-part question. So on one side, how did you get to this point? And also, what is there for us to do if we want to pursue a similar thing? Um, thank you, first of all. Um, so um, in my case, it's been a combination of, 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 of luck and 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 the fact that I understood at some point that I really do like to do investigations, and um, so what I did 
was after journalism school, um, I joined the magazine of Süddeutsche Zeitung um, as a freelancer. And m my tactics was always to do the work that can, can pay my room, but also do one or two stories a year that I really love and that I put all the work in that it needs, which no one is paying for. That's the sad thing. Because as a freelancer, if you are having a story that you're working on for three or four months, no one can pay that. Because they would have to pay you 10,000 euros or something like that. And no one is paying that anymore. So my trade-off was that I, they give me the platform to publish the stuff that I want to publish. And they pay me for, you know, um, doing smaller stories and redacting other stories and, and being part of the editorial team. But on the side, I always can do the stories that I really care for. And, and with those stories, you can't look at the economic side because economically, it doesn't make sense to work for four months and then get 400 euro for that because that's just crazy and silly. But if you think with that story, you make people in, in, the, in the journalism world recognize your name with your next story and, and to interest the, the big publications for your name because they might read that story and think, well, that's a great story. And it must have taken a long time to do that story. So someone here really is into that that kind of helped me. So I did this for, uh, for a number of years that I always had like two or three stories a year that where I threw m much more in than I got out of it um, money-wise. And then the head of our investigation team of Süddeutsche called me and said, look, do you want to work with us? So it kind of paid off then. Um, I don't know if I'm at all answering your question, but <laughs> so um, that's um, that's what I what I did, and 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 then of course you you need to be lucky that you have sources who trust you, and the best way to do that is to show it to show with with your pieces, with your stories that people can trust you. And and not not go the easy way um, um, when you when you're having finally when you're finally having a source, and you, source protection is always the, the most important thing. And and I've had stories that I've had not publish because the source in the last second said I'm afraid, you know I'm going to lose my job, I'm, I'm going to lose my, my my family. I don't want you to publish. And I think in this case, you know if it's not you know, a nuclear bomb beneath the city cathedral or whatever. I, I mean, this story you would have to do, but but in many other stories you, you have to you have to take uh, care of your sources, and and then people. So with the stories that you publish, and if you do them carefully, people are going to see that. So that at least that's my hope, and and then you can get you gain more trust and more trust, and the more trust, the more stories, and that's the only explanation that I have. Um, so and and then you, I mean, you need to be lucky, of course. It's it's not, it's easy said, but but so if I look back in the last years, um, I had colleagues that I knew were doing a really good job and were working hard. And for a couple of years, I thought, they're not getting rewarded for that. And that's a pity. But in the end, you could see them rise up. And you could see that their careers get more traction and they get more attention. And now they are staying there where they should be in the spotlight because they, they are really good. So I still believe that that hard work and and enthusiasm and the the will to do really really excellent journalism it still pays off i can't guarantee that i'm sorry but but but, but i've seen it a couple of times around me and of course you can't i mean no one can just say um 
I just want to get a huge leak because this just doesn't happen. It's just, it's really once in a lifetime that you get something and then, I mean, you should say thank you and, and make the best out of it. And, um, but it's, it's nothing that anyone can expect. But meanwhile, there is a number of people who have access to, to, to data that is leakable. And if you're the person who puts yourself in a position that your readers think, that guy, so if I had that story, I would give it to him. That's probably a good start. Yeah. Sure. We have uh, one last question, Vasin. Um, so the Panama Papers was six years ago. And so simply, uh, what have you learned si since then? Or what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, what advice would I give to myself? I would probably say, um, I would probably say, enjoy the ride and and look at the people next to you because you've got great colleagues and and that's really so working internationally is very very rewarding rewarding because you meet so many great colleagues um, while working there. Um, and also maybe a little that, you know, it, um, it may seem that a story doesn't get the traction or the, the impact that you're wishing for. But in the end, I mean, it often comes with a little, you know, some, it takes time. Um, and so we had some stories, for example, for the Panama Papers, or in the Panama Papers, um, where I put a lot of work in and, and we couldn't publish those because we didn't have the last proof that that guy really evaded 70 million taxes, actually. And uh, two years after, he got arrested in the US and he's now in jail for exactly that story. And I could take the story that we had already written and publish it then. So, so sometimes it takes time. So be patient. It's probably one okay. of the other advices. Well, thank you so so much for joining us today. I'm sounding very old here. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, it was a real pleasure. And uh, our next interview is on the 30th, 31st. It's with the vice president of your, the European Central Bank. So please feel free to join. Thank you.